Good day. My name is Professor Kenneth Dickstein, and I have the pleasure of narrating this PowerPoint presentation. The presentation will briefly summarize the essential principles involved in cardiac resynchronization therapy, or CRT, in patients with heart failure. Our primary objective is to describe the patient population that may be eligible for such a device. We hope that this information will be useful in deciding whether or not a patient should be referred to a cardiologist. As an example, a typical patient with heart failure seen in primary care will be presented. The clinical picture will be emphasized and we will discuss the consequences of bundle branch block on the ECG and the mechanisms by which prolonged depolarization leads to ventricular dyssynchrony. The randomized clinical trial evidence and some practical information will be briefly summarized along with the ESC guideline recommendations for CRT. Our patient, Henry, is a 76-year-old gentleman with symptomatic heart failure due to ischemic heart disease. Henry is in New York Heart Association Functional Class 3, has to pause on his way up the stairs due to shortness of breath, and can no longer vacuum the first floor of his house without taking a few breaks. He had a previous myocardial infarction, has mild obstructive airways disease, and stopped smoking following a resolution on New Year's Eve 2000. He is on adequate doses of a diuretic, ACE inhibitor, beta blocker, and aldosterone antagonist. Should the patient and doctor be satisfied? Heart failure is not a specific disease, but rather a syndrome with various causes such as previous myocardial infarction, hypertension, myocardial or valvular disease. However, no matter what the cause, the symptoms and signs of heart failure are usually similar in most patients. Objective evidence should confirm the diagnosis and provide information concerning the cause and mechanisms involved. The symptoms are usually nonspecific, although dyspnea with exertion should always be investigated. Certainly increasing dyspnea warrants immediate attention. Fatigue is common, but of course is frequently reported by older patients. Physical examination of patients with symptomatic heart failure will usually demonstrate signs of pulmonary and systemic congestion. Patients with symptomatic heart failure on optimal medical therapy and persistent symptoms should have an ECG taken. Left bundle branch block, although relatively rare in the general population, is frequent in patients with symptomatic heart failure. Up to one-third of symptomatic patients may have or develop evidence of this conduction abnormality. If the EKG shows a left bundle branch block pattern with a wide QRS complex, the patient may be a candidate for a CRT device. Left bundle branch block results in delayed and uneven activation of the heart muscle and dyssynchronous contraction of the left ventricle. Usually, the lateral wall is the site of latest contraction. This obviously may result in substantially reduced cardiac performance. This animation demonstrates the differences between sinus rhythm and left bundle branch block. As can be seen, the conduction block in the left bundle results in slower and delayed activation of the left ventricle. In left bundle branch block, the impulse is transmitted through ventricular myocardium rather than being delivered evenly and rapidly by the Purkinje system. This eventually leads to adverse remodeling with dilatation, volume overload, and frequently mitral insufficiency. It is essential that an ECG 
is taken from all patients with suspicion of heart failure and this should be repeated at regular time intervals. Left bundle branch block may easily be diagnosed on an ECG by looking at lead 1. Bundle branch block is diagnosed when the QRS complex is wide and over 120 milliseconds. In left bundle branch block, the wide complex is almost always completely positive in lead 1. In right bundle branch block, a wide negative S wave is invariably present in lead 1. The QRS complexes in V1 through V6 also differ markedly between left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block. As can be seen in these animations, both intra- and interventricular dyssynchrony will reduce cardiac function. Dyssynchrony is associated with prolonged and less efficient ejection, volume overload, and left ventricular dilatation. Over time, chronic dyssynchrony frequently leads to progressive cardiac failure. With the use of echo-based tissue Doppler imaging, or TDI, the contraction of the septum, seen here in yellow, and the lateral wall, seen here in blue, can be accurately assessed and timed. In the example to the right, the substantial delay between the contraction of the septum and lateral wall in a patient with left bundle branch block is readily demonstrated. Such dyssynchronous contractions lead to a vicious cycle. Poor left ventricular ejection leads to chronic volume overload and adverse remodeling. This term refers to adverse functional, geometric, and histological changes that result in left ventricular dilatation and regional differences in mechanical load, which further aggravate ventricular dysfunction. This magnetic resonance image, or MRI cine loop, compares normal left ventricular contraction with the dyssynchronous and ineffective contraction in a patient with left bundle branch block following anterior myocardial infarction. An anteroapical akinetic aneurysm can be seen. However, the presence of left bundle branch block with dyssynchrony further aggravates the left ventricular dysfunction. The CRT device consists of a pulse generator or pacemaker and three leads that are placed into the heart via the left subclavian vein. The first lead is placed in the right ventricle, the second lead is placed in the right atrium, and the third lead is threaded through the coronary sinus and placed posteriorly on the epicardium in a posterolateral coronary vein. A CRT device without an ICD or defibrillator is termed a CRTP. A CRT device incorporating an ICD is termed a CRTD. This short video demonstrates the technique involved in implanting a CRT device. The procedure involves placing three leads into the heart. First, the right ventricular lead is placed into the left subclavian vein and passed through the right atrium and tricuspid valve into a stable position in the right ventricle. Similarly, the right atrial lead is placed into the right atrium in a stable position near the sinus node. Placing of the third or left ventricular lead is more time consuming. A coronary sinus catheter is placed into the right atrium and then into the orifice of the coronary sinus. A balloon catheter is then placed into the coronary sinus catheter and contrast is injected into the coronary venous system. This will permit the operator to map out the coronary venous anatomy. The operator will then assess the venous anatomy and will usually target a posterolateral vein into which the third or left ventricular lead is placed. The three leads are then coupled to the pulse generator and implantation of the CRT device 
is complete. The lead placed in the right atrium senses the patient's sinus node frequency and therefore the heart rate is under normal physiological control. The lead placed in the right ventricle stimulates the anterior wall of the left ventricle and the lead placed in a coronary vein stimulates the posterior wall. Simultaneous impulses, or biventricular pacing, results in a shorter and more synchronous left ventricular contraction and improved cardiac function. Optimal programming of the device requires expertise and should be performed immediately following implantation with fine-tuning at regular intervals during outpatient follow-up. Patients with heart failure frequently have mitral regurgitation due to volume overload, left ventricular dilatation, and papillary muscle dyssynchrony. This echo loop demonstrates with color Doppler both the reduction in the size of the left ventricle and the mitral insufficiency following implantation of a CRT. CRT may reduce the leak to the left atrium by reductions of volume overload and improvements in papillary muscle synchrony. The evidence provided by a number of large randomized clinical trials is convincing and demonstrates efficacy over the broad spectrum of symptomatic patients with heart failure. These trials confirm sustained improvement in morbidity as evidenced by substantial relative risk reductions in hospitalizations for heart failure, as well as improved survival. These improvements in clinical outcomes with CRT are seen in addition to the expected improved survival in patients with an ICD only implanted. The efficacy of CRT therapy on improving clinical outcomes compares favorably to pharmacologic interventions. Meta-analyses estimate that approximately nine patients need to be treated in order to prevent one death or hospitalization during the duration of the trial's follow-up period. The effects of CRT on exercise tolerance are seen rapidly and are sustained. This study evaluated physical activity by the use of a simple pedometer. Irrespective of the patient's New York Heart Association class at baseline, substantial improvements in levels of mean physical activity were demonstrated. In a recent ESC survey of 2,438 patients in 13 countries, the average duration of hospitalization following implantation was two days. The average duration of the procedure was 100 minutes and the success rate for implantation was over 90 percent. Minor complications are seen in up to 10 percent of patients. Hospital mortality was only 0.5 percent, which is acceptable in that many of these patients were seriously ill during their hospitalization. All countries have limited health care resources and it is essential that we invest these resources in treatments with confirmed efficacy and target the patient population most likely to respond. The cost of a device is considerable and represents an initial investment. However, in contrast to medical therapy in which costs remain constant, the real cost of a CRT device will diminish over time in patients with a reasonably good prognosis. This treatment algorithm summarizes the recommendations from the most recent ESC heart failure guidelines. Note that these are Class 1A recommendations, meaning that the treatment is recommended and the evidence base is strong. Symptomatic patients should be placed on medical therapy, and this therapy should be up-titrated and fine-tuned according to the individual patient's clinical status. However, if symptoms persist and the patient has left bundle branch block and a QRS time over 120 milliseconds, they should be considered potential candidates for a device, either a CRTP or a CRTD. The clinical response 
is usually best in patients with a wider QRS complex. Patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, but without left bundle branch block, may be candidates for an ICD only. The final decision concerning eligibility and device type will be made by the cardiologist evaluating the patient. So let's visit our patient presenting to his GP with heart failure. Henry still complains of shortness of breath during mild to moderate activity. His ECG taken by the GP demonstrated left bundle branch block and a wide QRS complex. Henry deserved a discussion about the possibility of implanting a device. He was very pleased to hear that there might be another effective treatment option and was eager to visit the cardiologist. He was referred to an outpatient consultation. The echocardiographic study revealed left ventricular dilatation and a reduced ejection fraction. Returning to the treatment algorithm, we see that our patient satisfies the initial criteria. He is on optimal treatment with a diuretic, an ACE inhibitor, and a beta blocker, but still remains symptomatic. The ECG confirms typical left bundle branch block and the echo confirmed poor systolic function. The decision of whether or not to implant a CRT should consider the patient's biological age and extent of comorbidity. The cardiologist decided to implant a CRTP in this case. An ICD component was not considered necessary. Following an uncomplicated implantation, the patient reported noticeably improved exercise tolerance with definite improvement in his dyspnea. An echo demonstrated a significant improvement in his ejection fraction. Importantly, Henry feels better. He can walk up the stairs without pausing and does not regret having had the procedure performed. In spite of our extensive experience with CRT confirming improved quality of life and outcomes in clinical practice, most eligible patients are never evaluated as potential candidates. There are two reasons for this. Firstly, over half of the patients do not have their ECG taken at regular intervals in order to detect left bundle branch block and identify potential candidates. Secondly, almost two-thirds of patients diagnosed as eligible are not referred to a cardiologist. There may be several reasons for non-referral, but this does deny many patients the opportunity for proper evaluation. So the take-home message is, in patients with symptomatic heart failure, take an ECG at regular intervals and look for a wide QRS complex with a left bundle branch block pattern. Your patient may well be a candidate for a CRT device and benefit with substantial improvement in symptoms along with an improved prognosis. Information for patients and their caretakers is easily accessible and readily available by entering the ESC website of the Heart Failure Association, www.heartfailurematters.com. This website is available in seven languages. Guidelines for healthcare professionals for the use of CRT in patients with heart failure, along with the evidence-based recommendations, is provided by the 2012 Heart Failure Guidelines, which can be downloaded from www.escardio.org. Thanks for taking the time to go through this presentation. We hope you found it useful.